after and raised in Scotland and then finally when she was old enough she'd go on and take the throne for herself so she's about seven years old two on a boat to come to Scotland and I don't know how to break this to you she dies too she gets ill on the journey and she she dies when the ship's tied up in the harbour at Orkney so she doesn't even make it to mainland Scotland now many people had an opinion about this there was a lot of conspiracy theories as to what happened whether she was actually really ill or if somebody had done her in, okay? But I think that happens a lot with when young princesses die, so I'm told. Anyway, the, the result was the same. We'd been waiting for years for this wee lass to come. Scotland needed a king fast. At dangerous times, no one's on the throne. So what do we do now? Well, now the nobles decide any nobleman of royal blood could lay claim to the throne of Scotland. 13 claimants come forward, no, all with mommy. a decent claim on the throne. Oh, 13 of them all want to be king. Well, they agree. No chances, they all want to be king after all. So what they did was, they decided to stop all the battling and fighting and arguing that was going on. They would invite the King of England to come and judge who would be the best King of Scotland. Yeah, you're shaking your head and I, I know why. It sounds mad to me. It does, but our nobles thought it was a good idea. They thought the English King, having been our old King's friend and brother-in-law, would at least be fair. He'd be impartial. Aye, right. Who does he choose? He chooses the weakest one, doesn't he? He chooses a man called John Balliol. Everyone thought he was the weakest out of the 13. Why would he choose him? Maybe he thought that Balliol would be so weak he'd just hand over Scotland's land and wealth to England on a silver platter. But he was wrong. Balliol, he starts to revive Scotland's old alliance between the Scots and the French. So when the English king 
King Edward, he comes along and he commands our king to raise a Scottish army to fight for England against the French. Belial, remember he was the weak one, refuses. He says no to the king of England. Right, the English king does not like being refused. So he sends his army north, they attack the Scots, and they slaughter 8,000 Scots. Right, 8,000 slaughtered. This isn't a big battle. You know, a big battle, a fair fight. No, it's 8,000 innocents, residents of the town of Berwick and the surrounding areas, all slaughtered. It's a bloodbath. Now, after this, Belial does raise a Scottish army. We to fight the English, not the French, but we are defeated at Dunbar. Now, after this, Belial, he's stripped of his crown, exiled and imprisoned. Thank and you. I understand exactly Thank why you. that would happen. I get it. What I can't get my head round is why after this defeat there would be 2,000 of our own nobles and clergy would bow, surrender and pledge their allegiance to the King of England. Now that's our own people doing that. Okay? And Edward then sent English soldiers and magistrates to every town and village right through Scotland to enforce English laws on Scottish people. Oh, and, let's not forget, English taxes too. Does it sound fair at all, does it? It doesn't sound fair to me. Anyway, this is what Scotland was like up to a year before the great battle down there, the Battle of Stirling Bridge. In that year, though, someone came along and they turned Scotland's fortunes right round. Now, is that a big enough clue for you? Aye. See, a year before the Battle of Stirling Bridge, no one had heard of William Wallace. Aye, we've all heard of him now, though. So William, he was born in a wee village in the west of Scotland called Eldersley, and he was the second of three sons. It just means he would grow up knowing he wasn't going to inherit anything. Land or money would go to the firstborn, the eldest son. So William was studying hard training to become a priest. And I just want you to let that sink in a little. <laughs> what history might have been like if William Wallace had stayed a priest? Quite strange, isn't it? Not what you'd imagine of the man. Anyway, he had a quick and violent temper, so maybe he wasn't really cut out for the job anyway, I don't know. I certainly wouldn't have said it to his face. And he was always in trouble for fighting English soldiers that were persecuting his fellow countrymen. And slowly, he gathered like-minded people around him. And he began attacking the English convoys and their supply routes. And he made himself a right nuisance to the King of England. So much so, he was declared outlaw. And they wanted him arrested. Now they knew he was hiding at his father-in-law's house in Lanark. So they sent the Sheriff of Lanark, a man called Hesselrig, and he gets his soldiers together. They go along the house and they set the house on fire, right? As you do, to burn people out, to get them to run so you can catch them. Right, but William wasn't there. He was already away. His wife was there, though, Marion. She was there. She runs from the flames. Hesselrig spots this, orders his soldiers to her grab, run back into the burning house, and she dies in the fire. Horrible. When William Wallace hears this news, he's now in a rage. He gathers 30 men, probably all he could muster, marches them up to the garrison of Lanark, boards up the English soldiers in their own barracks. You know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> Sets them on fire. He then hunts down Hesselrig, the sheriff, drags him to the centre of the town, and in front of the good people of Lanark assembled there, William Wallace kills him. He does. There's no question about this. He kills him because of what he's done to his wife, of course. And now to the English, William Wallace is just a murdering, treacherous Scot, isn't he? Funny that, because to us here, he's a hero, isn't he? Two sides of the same coin, I'm sure. However, more and more people joined him. What was getting around Scots were fighting back. And this uprising against the English no, no, in control of Scotland wasn't limited to just this part of Scotland. It was right across. In the far north, the people there followed Andrew de Mori. He was an important man. He was a nobleman. One of the last loyal nobles in Scotland. And he had gathered a huge force, marched them to Dundee, where Scrimger, another strange name man that people followed, Scrimger in the east, Kept Dundee surrounded, trying to wrestle it back from the English control. 
and I marched with William Wallace and his men up to Dundee to join in the siege. And that was the first time William Wallace and Andrew de Murray met. And when they joined forces, it looked like we had the makings of a decent army. Now we weren't there long before news arrived that the King of England was sending his army north to put an end to the Scottish uprising. So Wallace and de Murray conferred and agreed that the leave Scrimgeour and his men at Dundee, we would join forces and march here to this hill, the Abbey Craig and Stirling, to face the English in a mighty battle. We couldn't allow them to cross the River Forth, or they could get right through to the north of Scotland. Now the English, they had their camp in Stirling Castle there. They controlled that part, so you can see that from here. So from here, we could see everything the English army were doing. We could see how outnumbered we were. I'd never seen so many people like that in my life. And the colours and their banners, flags and tents. Never seen anything like it. They were an awesome sight, fearsome. I think Wallace was even a little afraid when he looked at us. A ragtag band of an army facing up to a well-trained force like the English army. Now, the thing was to Murray and Wallace had come up with a plan. They knew that the English army, the soldiers in armour and the heavy horse. Now, let me tell you, I thought a heavy horse was a fat horse. It isn't. A heavy horse is a horse that's got armour on it, right? So even their horses were better equipped than we were. But they knew that these soldiers in armour and the heavy horse would be useless on waterlogged marshland that lay on this side of the river. So we waited here and watched as the English army began to assemble on the far side of the river, ready to cross over the wee bridge, over they came to abreast. Then, for some reason we didn't know at the time, they stopped turned and retreated again. Well, we cheered. We thought we'd won. We found out later on, we'd heard that the Earl of Surrey, he'd slept in. Ah, he was having a long line. He needed his breakfast before he'd come and slaughter any Scots. So for a second time that day, we watched them line up, starting to come across. Only this time, they sent two monks over, clerics. Well, they came and they tried to bribe William Wallace. They offered him land, titles and money to withdraw his men from the field of battle. Well, William took them aside and he told them this. He said, I didn't come here to talk or to be bought. I came here to free this country. And although we're outnumbered, we would rather die on our feet than live a moment longer on our knees. Oh, he set them packing all right. So for a third time that day, we stood waiting and we were keen to get into the battle, but Wallace made sure we held our positions. We weren't to move until he gave us the call to charge. Now, as he started to cross, there was about 2,000 soldiers came over, a couple of hundred heavy horse. And when Wallace saw they were truly stuck in the mud, I only then did they give us the order to charge. And we ran down the hillside ribbon, right and left with our claymores and our axes. Oh man, I wish you'd been there to see it. <laughs> oh, it was a bonny, bonny sift. Aye. Well, the ferocity of our attack took the English by surprise. They turned and fled, trying to get back over the bridge again. But such was the size of their army, they couldn't cross. Their soldiers were still trying to come onto this side, so the, the bridge was blocked, they couldn't get over. And Wallace had sent spearmen down to close off the loop in the river. So the English soldiers on this side were completely trapped, either by our spearmen or the river itself. The English soldiers, many of them drowned, dragged down by the weight of their own armour to the bottom of the river, their horses too. Now, the bridge was just a wee wooden bridge. It started to creak and groan. Wallace got the archers to fire burning arrows into the wooden bridge and it was soon destroyed completely. That trapped the English, as I said, and they, although they fought bravely, they were defeated. Victory was ours that day, but it came at a price. Andrew de Murray is badly wounded and I don't think he will survive. Wallace will continue to lead us, but this English king hasn't done with us. He will send another army, but are you with me? If he comes, we're going to be ready and waiting for him, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure we can frighten him more than that. <laughs> Hi! 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 Very good, thanks very much, Hi. thank you very much. If you've got any other questions, I won't try and answer them, but I don't know very much. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. If anyone wants a photograph, you're very welcome to see it.